By the year 2000, the PlayStation was already home to many spectacular JRPGs. I mean, you got Squaresoft's whole catalog, including the Final Fantasy series and stuff like Xenogears, Chrono Cross, and many more. And then there were some fairly popular games from other developers like the Wild Arms series, the Suikoden series, Star Ocean 2, Grandia, Legend of Ligaia, The Legend of Dragoon, and of course, Breath of Fire 3. While Breath of Fire 3 certainly wasn't as popular as series like Final Fantasy, it still got pretty good reception from critics and was loved by fans. If you were a fan of JRPGs during that time period, there was a pretty good chance that you would at least like that game to some degree. With that said, the Breath of Fire series as a whole actually first got its start on the Super Nintendo with Breath of Fire 1 and 2. The first one was seen as pretty average for the time, whereas the second one is generally regarded as a solid entry. In fact, it wouldn't be an unpopular opinion to say that there were some pretty big, noticeable improvements between each of the first three games. That brings us back to 2000, when the fourth entry in the series, and topic of this video, Breath of Fire 4, was about to be released. I remember seeing a lot of magazine ads for it leading up to its release, and there seemed to be some decent hype for it. This was sort of around the time when I first started getting into JRPGs, so I'm not gonna lie, they had me pretty excited. I'm not sure why, but I remember ordering the game off eBay back then for some reason, and reading all these beginner's tips on game FAQs in the meantime, just waiting for it to get there. When it finally did arrive one day after school, I instantly popped it open, played it for a few hours, and had a hell of a time. Despite how much I loved the game though, I never actually beat it as a kid, and didn't just beat it for the first time until this recent playthrough. We'll see if there's a valid reason for that or not. As with all the other titles, of course, Breath of Fire 4 was developed by Capcom and came out on April 27th in Japan and November 28th in North America. Just a couple weeks after the release of Final Fantasy IX, actually. Yeah, definitely a hard act to follow, especially so soon after. Despite that, however, Breath of Fire 4 absolutely delivered and gave us one of the most polished RPGs on the entire system. It was praised a lot for its stunning visuals and tight gameplay, and received the best reviews in the series thus far. Nearly 22 years after its initial release, how does it stack up now, though? Well, That's exactly what I aim to find out in this video. Just a quick disclaimer though. Being a retrospective, there might be some light spoilers at times in some clips, but any significance or late game spoilers, we will mark with timestamps and give you time to skip ahead. Now, with that cleared up, join us, my friends, as we take a deep dive retrospective look into this Capcom classic and peak of their traditional RPG formula, Breath of Fire 4. The story of Breath of Fire 4 begins with the heroine of the series, Nina, along with her bodyguard Cray, as they explore the vast desert on their sand flyer in search of the missing Wendy and Princess, Alina, who also happens to be Nina's sister. Right off the bat, I just gotta say, I really love the main theme of the game. It just has like this really hopeful and uplifting tone to it. It gets remixed throughout the game a lot in various versions, so be prepared to hear this melody quite a bit. Anyway, shortly after, you get attacked by a massive sand dragon, causing your sand flyer to crash. Well, not really attacked, but just caught up in its path, which ultimately had the same result. As you can tell, dragons in this game have a pretty interesting design, and probably not what you had in mind when you think of the term dragon at least. Granted, not all the dragons in this game look like this one, but they're still unique all the same. If you thought you were gonna get generic, four legged dragons with wings that can breathe fire and shit, despite the title of the series literally being called Breath of Fire, you're looking in the wrong place. You won't find those here. The world and setting of Breath of Fire 4 is certainly one of the most unique in the series. Back to the story though. 
With the sand flyer now crashed, Nina and Cray need some parts for it to start working again. However, they can't both leave the sand flyer alone, or else they run the risk of it getting stolen by bandits. So, they come to the decision that Cray will guard the broken sand flyer, while Nina will travel to a nearby town collecting the parts they need. First rule of bodyguarding, send your client off to wander the desert alone. Nice one, Cray. On her way to town, Nina comes across a giant hole in the sand, and of course, finds a way to get trapped in it herself. She then gets approached by a different dragon that seems to vanish just as soon as it appeared. It doesn't disappear completely though and instead leaves a young, blue-haired man in its wake. And a very naked one at that. I like how he looks down at himself all like, Oh shit, I am fucking naked, aren't I? How'd that get there? We find out his name's Ryu and, well, that's really all we find out. He doesn't remember anything else. Regardless, they still decide to travel together, thinking that Ryu may be able to find out some information about who he is at the town Nina's going to. After a nice little mountainside stroll and peaceful night there, the duo finally arrives in the border town Sarai. Man, I gotta be honest here, I'm not really that crazy about Sarai as a starting town. I do really like the concept of a merchant trade desert town, but it's just way too small with all these narrow hallways and difficult camera angles making it hard to see things. In its defense, I think this was intentional, as I'm sure they wanted you to get used to how you have to adjust the camera angles in order to see certain items and people at times, but still, intentional or not, I'm just not a fan. It's like, yeah, you could intend to take a shit in a dish, but that doesn't make it good though. And before you get ready to smash that dislike button, I'm not calling Breath of Fire 4 a shitty game. Far from it. It's an absolutely spectacular game. I'm only saying that just because a design choice is intentional, doesn't automatically equate it to being good. I just think this town could have been better if it was a lot more open and had more space to run around it. In my opinion, at least. Anyway. I almost forgot to mention that before you actually make it to Sarai, the game switches over to the perspective of a different character and probably one of the most unique things about it. In Breath of Fire 4, you don't just play as the protagonist of the story, you also play as one of the antagonists, the first emperor of the Fo Empire, Fo Lu. And I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. I really love this aspect of the game as it adds such an interesting insight. I'll touch on this in more detail later, but I want to wrap up the story segment first. In this first Fo'olu part, we basically just find out that Fo'olu is a dragon god who has apparently been asleep for a very long time, and that the Fo Empire is out to capture him. We also meet this little roly-poly looking dude by the name of Yom, a general in the Empire. Overall, this whole segment's dope. I like how you're already fighting dinosaurs and shit, doing thousands of damage, compared to like the mere 100 that Ryu does at this time. It's effective in showing how immense that power gap is, and just how much ass Folu kicks in general. Now, back to Nina and Ryu and Sarai. I'm gonna start moving through things a little bit more quickly until I get to the part where I feel like the story truly opens up. Ryu and Nina temporarily part ways. Ryu finds out some information on how to get Sandflyer parts. They link back up, go to Sandflyer Valley together. Then, after collecting some scrap parts, they go back to Sarai to get the parts fixed. However, before they can do that, they get confronted by a commander in the Empire, Rasso, and experience a bit of hostility, you could say. He was sent to these parts to look for a dragon, and unbeknownst that one is literally standing right in front of him, he sets his sights on capturing Nina instead. The two barely manage to make a break for it, and wind up in the nearby town of Chamba. Unfortunately, passing through Chamba isn't really the easiest, as it's still recovering from a Hex attack from the last war, rendering most of the town inaccessible. I'll touch more on Hexes later, but all you need to know now is, it's basically like a giant, cursed, poisoned area that most normal people can't pass through. To get past this, Ryu and Nina enlist the help of Urshin, a weird, eccentric, suit of armor, robot looking thing that wears a little cape and talks in third person. There is a reason for the third person speak, but we'll cover that later. Urshin as a character is friggin awesome, though I love how it's always saying brutally honest stuff and then laughing inappropriately afterwards. It's a funny bit, I, I, I just like it. After making it through the Chamba Hex, the trio finally meets back up with the homie Cray again. They may not have gotten the Sandflyer parts fixed, but hey, at least they have each other, right? That night, they all end up having the same dream where they're infiltrating some mysterious place, getting ready to rescue Alina. 
When they wake, they come to the realization that they all just shared that same dream, to which Urshan replies, it was actually Ryu's dream. For some, at the time, unknown reason, apparently, Urshan can tell that Ryu has a dragon's eye, which allows him to see possible futures. The party doesn't really know what to make of everything, but they do know that this is the best lead they have right now, and that there's a possibility of finding Alina if they continue to travel with Ryu. And so, Kray and Nina resume their journey to find Alina, just now with two more companions by their side, who seem to be of mysterious origin and perhaps involved in something greater. This is where I feel the story in Breath of Fire 4 truly begins. Man, is the story in this game damn good. Easily one of the stronger aspects about it. Because I never actually beat the game as a kid, I never came to realize just how deep and mature the story really was. Like honestly, between some of the themes that it covers, and some particular scenes later in the game, the story has definitely got to be one of the darkest out of all the PS1 RPGs. It's right up there with games like Xenogears and perhaps even more chilling at times, just due to the unexpectedness of it and how some music affects the scenes. Plus, in games like Xenogears, you know almost right from the start that it's going to be a pretty dark game. Breath of Fire 4, on the other hand, starts all lighthearted with these bright and cheery graphics and just kind of make you feel like you're in for an easygoing, feel-good playthrough. That may be the case early on, but later? Not so much. I think it comes down to subverting your feelings and expectations, which makes it hit even harder. I'll touch more on this later in the spoiler segment, but let's talk characters for now. Overall, I'm quite a big fan of the cast in this game. The character design is just as interesting as ever, and the party dynamic, along with how they converse with one another, just may be the best in the series. Like, I loved the cast in Breath of Fire 3, I just wish they would have talked to each other a little bit more. While I still wouldn't say that Breath of Fire 4 does this as well as some other RPGs, it was certainly a pretty big improvement. I think there were some missed opportunities for some more character-driven moments at times, but still, not bad overall. Even though Ryu is technically the official protagonist and much of the game's story revolves around him, with him being silent by design, it almost feels like Nina is more of the main character at times due to the game being seen and told through her perspective and often expressing what the player is thinking. I mean, shit, she is the first character you control, so you could make the argument that she actually is the main character in this game. I haven't played Breath of Fire 1 and 2 in over a decade, so I can't say for sure, but it's probably her biggest involvement in the series thus far. I think Kray's a great character, cool design, strong in battle, and his actions, along with how he responds to situations, seems pretty realistic. I may prefer Rey from Breath of Fire 3 just a little bit more, but I still like Kray a lot. Urshan, as I've previously discussed, is just flat out awesome, and her true nature and interesting backstory just make her even cooler. I mean, come on, a beautiful hedonistic goddess trapped inside a magical suit of armor? What's not to love? Though I guess I should distinguish those personalities differently, considering they're like two different people. Dace is the goddess, while Urshan is the sentient suit of armor that houses Dace. It's a really unique concept. Ursula, I honestly didn't really like that much at first, but she grew on me a lot. It was cool to learn her backstory and why she was so faithful to the Empire. She also provides some unexpected comedic bits like that one where she shoots down Khan, a recurring boss throughout the game, and just plays it straight. I remember seeing that and being like, okay, this chick's awesome. It is hard for me to decide who I like better between her and Momo though, the two of them both being gun characters and whatnot. My only gripe is that you get her pretty late in the game, maybe at about the halfway point, or even a little bit past that. Oh well. Sias, I want to love, and I do, but still have some mixed feelings about him. On one hand, his character design is cool as shit, I mean he's a dog samurai for god's sake, and he's naturally quite strong in battle. However, Unfortunately, he gets like little to no development throughout the game, and after his arc is over, just like fades into the background and only provides funny one-liners here and there from there on out. It probably doesn't fix the issue entirely, but there is partial explanation for this. In the original Japanese version, Sias is actually an alcoholic who is constantly slurring his speech. In the North American release, though, they removed all traces of his alcoholism and just changed his speech impediment to a stuttering problem. 
I don't know exactly how much of his dialogue was cut out between these two versions, but I am curious if there was any of his development that we missed out on. If anyone's played the Japanese version and can actually answer that, let us know in the comments. I gotta be real for a sec here though. While I know most people hate how they butchered his character, and knowing the information that I do now, I do agree that it sucks. However, as a kid who grew up with a stuttering problem and had to take a speech class for it in elementary school, I found his stuttering really cool and relatable as it allowed me to relate to an RPG character in a way I never had before. For that reason alone, I loved his character as a kid and always had him in my party. But yeah, after finding out what actually happened to his character, I was like... Oh, okay, yeah, that would have been pretty cool too, and probably even better. I always liked competent drunk fighters going back to the art of drunken boxing and stuff like that. Lastly, that leaves us with Ryu and Folu. With Ryu, there's not much to comment on, being a silent protagonist and whatnot, but Folu, on the other hand, I fucking love this dude and his journey. It was such a great design choice to allow us to sporadically play as him in short segments throughout the game, as it gives us a lot of insight into his character and why he is the way he is. It's also a great example in showing just how important the environment can be in shaping people into who they are. Ryu and Folu are two halves of the same being, the Yorei Dragon, a powerful god of which gods are referred to in this game as the Endless due to their immortality. However, how the majority of people treated them when they came into this world was very different. Between Nina and all of the other companions, Ryu was just shown a lot of kindness, love, and respect. I mean, yeah, you had the Empire trying to hunt him down, but the people closest to him in his life only meant well, and that goes a long way. Plus, the literal first person that he met in Nina just wanted to help him. With Folu on the other hand though, the first people he met wanted to kill him. In fact, most people he met during his time in the Empire wanted to kill him. The only exceptions really being Bunyan and Mammy. But still, it wasn't enough to overcome the vast amount of hostility he received otherwise. So yeah, essentially, Ryu was shown a lot of love and a little hate, whereas Folu was shown a lot of hate and only a little love. It's an interesting dichotomy for sure. The duality between these two and how that affects their worldviews plays really heavily into the major themes of the game. I think one of the biggest lessons it's trying to teach here is that no matter how fucked up the world may be, and despite there being some corrupt, evil people out there, there's still a lot of good out there as well and that most people only want the best for mankind, and those people make the world worth protecting. This also kind of ties into learning from past mistakes and not letting history repeat itself. It brings about the question, can humanity really be forgiven for its sins and strive for a better future? It really wants you to think hard about it and consider both sides. As I've grown older, I've really come to appreciate the lack of black and white morality in some games and Breath of Fire 4 does this really well I think. In my opinion, it's definitely one of the RPGs from that era that makes you think the most. Anyway, I'll touch some more on how they handled some late game events later, but for now, let's switch it up and talk about the battle system. The combat in Breath of Fire 4 absolutely kicks ass and is one of the most polished and most fun traditional turn-based battle systems I've ever played. Definitely my favorite combat in the series. Well, for the most part that is, but I'll get to that part in a bit. At the core, it's pretty much just your standard turn-based system, but it has a lot of extra cool elements that just elevates it to a higher level. While technically, you can only fight with three characters at a time, all six of your party members remain in battle, allowing you to swap any of them out seamlessly whenever you want to. Your back row party members can't attack, but they do recover AP just being there, and still get affected by group heals. This of course means that all of your characters receive experience points, regardless if they actually took an active part in battle or not. This is a huge step up from Breath of Fire 3. What's also new in this entry is the combo system. Essentially, you can combine certain spells and abilities to create combos and new attacks entirely. For example, the Wind Spell Sever is an ability that Nina starts with, and if you combine it with the Fire Spell Burn that you learned from Mage Goose in the first area, you can create an even stronger spell, Fire Wind. On top of this, you can also add a third ability to extend the combo even further, however, it won't actually change the spell again and just adds to the damage and hit counter. It's not always obvious what abilities combine together to create new ones, so you'll have to do a little experimenting around, or just look up a guide online. 
I should note though that combos can be interrupted if enemies attack in between your skills, and considering there's really no way to know this for sure before a turn, it can get a little annoying. Showing the turn order on screen like in Final Fantasy X or the Trails games could go a long way here I think. Overall though, I really love the combo system as a whole and it's an absolute travesty we never got this expanded upon further in later entries. There's just so much potential there waiting to be fulfilled. To backtrack to what I said earlier about learning skills from enemies, this system makes its return from Breath of Fire 3 pretty much unchanged. In order to learn a skill, you have to have a character defend when an enemy is using the skill you want to learn, and then you have a random chance of actually learning it or not. Not every enemy's skill is learnable, but you can tell which ones are at least by the blue text. Another way you can learn abilities is by learning them from masters. The master system allows you to study under various masters you meet throughout the game that apply different stat bonuses upon leveling up, or the opposites of bonuses in some cases, and also teach you various skills based on meeting certain requirements. It's a pretty cool system that allows for a lot of variety in how you wish to build your party. And hey, they even brought Momo back as a master in this game, so that was pretty cool as well. Not sure what's up with Cryrick though, Dude's lips take up like half his face. It's like, bruh, are you even human? Now, I've mentioned a lot of good with the battle system so far, but unfortunately, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. While the dragon transformation system is still an awesome concept and not done bad, it still seems like a pretty lazy step backwards compared to how they handled it in the third game. In Breath of Fire 3, the gene splicing mechanic allowed you to transform into various forms of dragons with tons of different, unique sprites. In this game though, while there technically are different dragon transformations, the sprite never changes and always stays the same so it just kinda takes away some of that coolness factor. It was handled so well in the previous game so I just don't know why they cut some corners here. On the bright side, I guess, the animation and sound bite that plays when you are transforming into a dragon is pretty damn legit and does a great job at getting you hyped. <laughs> On that note though, what better time to talk about the battle visuals and sprite animations. The sprites just look so damn gorgeous and are animated excellently. Hands down, some of the smoothest, most fluid sprite animation on the entire PlayStation, RPG or not. I feel like time has only allowed it to age even better as well. I know I certainly appreciate the graphics much more than I did back in the day, that's for sure. Like the way characters' hair and clothes just sways in the wind when standing there idly, on top of the cool lighting effects when some characters are getting ready to use spells or abilities, is just absolutely top notch. Capcom was definitely at their finest here. It's not just the character sprites that look good though. Enemy sprites look just as amazing, if not even better. They just have so much detail in both their idle animations and actions. Some enemies I just had to pause for a sec and be like, Alright Dan, that looks cool as shit. Some enemy sprites can also change mid-battle based on attacking them with a certain spell, which I thought was a pretty neat touch as well. With that said, most regular enemy sprites look great, but bosses on the other hand, eh, sort of a mixed bag. They opted for 3D polygons for most of these, and most of them are just... okay. Some do look pretty cool I guess, but overall, I don't think these aged as well as the sprites. What has aged well, I think, though, is just the life and charm of the world. One thing I've always really loved about the Breath of Fire series is just how diverse the worlds are with all the different races and species. I mean, there's cat-like people, dog-like people, bird-like people, fairies, and yeah, you get the idea. It just helps the world feel really fleshed out with all these distinct cultures. Like, even within the dog-like people, they can still look completely different. Sias and the first master Rewolf, or however the hell you pronounce his name, are good examples. That reminds me, all of the different character portraits in this game are a really nice touch. Even a lot of random, unnamed NPCs will still have unique character portraits. Not a huge fan of this as it just helps the game feel more immersive and gives it a lot of personality. Some of the towns have a lot of personality as well. Warrant, Windia, and Kyria are great examples. Absolutely love the vibe in Warrant probably my favorite town in the game. 
With that said, I do have to say the towns in this game do feel a little disappointing as a whole though. Your party even makes a remark about how small Chamba is when you get there, but that criticism also applies to most of the other towns really. They're usually pretty contained and only like a screen long for the most part, Windia being one of the exceptions. The, at times, confusing camera angles doesn't really help either. In my opinion, some bigger, more sprawling towns would have been nice. Oh well, anyway. I touched on this briefly earlier, but I also really appreciate just how unique the dragon designs are in this game. No dragon looks the same, and they all have two completely different forms. They're giant, actual dragon-like looking form, and a much smaller, more humanoid looking form. I will say though, that the music that plays when you are asking a dragon for its help is a little creepy. It just gives off this ominous atmosphere and has you feeling like, damn, am I getting myself involved in things I shouldn't be? Pretty interesting vibe for sure. The music as a whole though, it's pretty solid. I wouldn't say it's my favorite in the series, as that honor goes to number 3 for me due to the jazzy influence, but it does have some real standout tracks that are some of my favorites in the series. My favorite tracks from the game are probably the song from the opening animation, all the variations of the main theme, Song of Plains, and Prayer. Prayer in particular just sits super hard as it always comes in really memorable scenes, like the one with that random boar ramming himself into the wall, essentially killing and sacrificing himself just for Folu to pass. The song just helps make that death feel a lot more poetic in a way. It's an interesting scene. Truth and Dreams is probably my favorite variation of the main theme as it just has like this thought provoking like mood to it. Whenever I hear this, it's pretty hard not to just want to reflect and think. I think it's my favorite overall track in the game and is the first song I think of when I think of Breath of Fire 4. It probably gets played the most throughout the game as well, so you better get used to it. Going back a bit to the song from the opening animation, can we just take a moment to appreciate how dope that intro is in general? I absolutely loved watching this as a kid and never skipped it. I always viewed it as like a pre-game for the play session to get me all hyped and immersed in the world. Easily one of my favorite openings from that era. It's hard to pick favorites, but it's pretty up there with the Wild Arms 1 and 2 intros, in terms of anime-styled PS1 openings at least. I love the occasional bits of actual Japanese dialogue thrown in there as well. Obviously, I didn't understand what the hell they were saying, but 12 year old Weed Me thought it sounded really cool regardless. The last thing I'll say about the music is I thought it was really interesting how they handled it in more nature like environments. Or I guess it's not really music in this case, but lack of music. In any type of outdoorsy area, whether it's a mountain, a forest, a desert, whatever, no music plays at all, and instead it's just the ambient nature sounds. It's a unique design choice, and I think for the most part it works. It just creates a completely different vibe and atmosphere, especially compared to its peers. Like, you can't tell me you just don't feel so relaxed and one with nature while traversing through the Kyria woods. <sighs> so peaceful. While the field environments are done well, the world map on the other hand, eh, they really kind of dropped the ball here. It's just super bland looking and considering every location is represented by the same dot, it just makes it sort of confusing to navigate around unless you memorize where everything is. You eventually do unlock fast travel I guess, but still. It's just really uninspired and one of the worst parts about the game. I mean, just look at all the differing terrains and how bright and colorful the world map is in Breath of Fire 3. It's night and day different. There's even some unique locations represented by the same punctuation, making it impossible to tell which is which and it's just like, ugh, come on man. While I'm already nitpicking, I'm just gonna list my other petty grievances as well, before talking about the ending and other spoilers. 
Like I mentioned near the beginning of the video, the camera angles can just be a little bit of a mess at times. I appreciate the freedom they give to the player and what they were going for, but it just doesn't always work that well. Movement just kind of feels weird too to be honest. You can only move in certain directions, making it feel a little stiff compared to the full 3D a lot of other RPGs at that time were offering. This isn't really a huge deal, it just made exploration feel maybe not quite as good as it could be. It's fine I guess though, you get used to it. In addition to what I said earlier in the video about how they changed Sias' character between regions, that wasn't the only change they made, unfortunately. There's also a bathing scene involving Ryu, Nina, and Ursula, multiple other scenes involving Ursula, and a decapitation scene. The former aren't that big a deal, but the last one? This is absolutely vital to the story, so it's just so stupid they censored this out. In its original state, the scene just hits so much harder, so yeah, th th this just sucks. This last one is more neutral, but I do want to talk about all the minigames. I really like the variety of these added gameplay, as it's always good to switch things up. Only when done well that is though. I do think Breath of Fire 4 does this a lot better than 3, but it still misses sometimes in some segments where it's just too much. Like rafting down the river and dueling with that sailor on the ship, fantastic, love them. But cleaning up a storage room and operating a crane, dude I don't even like cleaning in real life, why would I want to do that in a video game? And cranes? What's up with games always doing this? I remember the Final Fantasy VII Remake had a giant crane section as well. However, I can't ever remember completing a crane operation minigame and being like, wow, what a fun use of my time. No disrespect, if there are any crane operators watching this, I'm sure it's more fun in real life. But yeah, early on in the game, there's a part where you do both these minigames, a hide and seek game, and a catch the bandit minigame. All four of these minigames happen in like the same hour and it just kills the pacing. I remember when I first rented the game from Blockbuster back in the day, I actually gave up here. I was like, bruh, am I playing Breath of Fire or Breath of Tiring minigames? Man, if you didn't leave after that lame joke, thanks for still being here. With that said, the minigames they actually put a lot of effort into are really good. The fishing, and especially the fairy village building system, are done quite well and have a lot of depth. Fishing was always a common minigame in RPGs back then, and still is now, really. But the whole fairy village thing was just really unique and pretty ambitious. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't really bother with these two on my recent playthrough, but I at least wanted to give them a shout out, as I know some people really love them. Now, with all that said, before I end the video with my closing thoughts on the game, I want to do a quick little spoiler segment where I talk about some of my favorite scenes or just my thoughts on how they handled some things. So, just a fair warning, if you haven't played the game, it's recommended you skip to the timestamps below. But if you don't care about being spoiled on some of the best scenes in the game, then, well, that choice is yours to make, my friend. So yeah, final warning. We good? Alright, let's go. Commander Rasso absolutely sucked, so watching Ryu blast his ass into oblivion was extremely satisfying. Through fire, justice is served, and if you get that reference, you're pretty cool. The tragic tale of Folu and Mammy was straight up gut-wrenching. I mean, she's this nice little countryside girl unknowingly nursing a god back to health and only just wants to have a quiet, peaceful life with him. But because some people are insecure assholes and fear what they don't understand, does this happen? No. Granted, Folu probably would have followed his destiny regardless, but still, it wasn't even an option. And you can tell he does briefly consider it for a moment when she's holding the guards at the door. With that said, it gets much worse from here. Remember what I said earlier in the video about hexes? Well, we find out these are launched from what are called carronade cannons, and in order to fire a hex attack, you need to sacrifice a living person. Not only that, but the hex is powered by negative human emotions, meaning the subject is relentlessly tortured before the sacrifice to bring out maximum effect, and the stronger connection the subject has to a particular area, the stronger the hex is gonna be. I don't even need to explain how fucked up this is, it's one of the darkest things I've ever seen in an RPG. 
So yeah, going back to Mammy, since the Empire wasn't able to capture Fo Lu, they do capture her and prepare her for a hex attack. The scene where they're getting ready to fire her is just so unsettling with the creepy ass music and the dudes in hoods and stuff and uh, yeah, this scene just gives me the chills. Since Fo Lu was still around the area that Mammy is from, the hex hits super hard and immediately turns the whole area into a giant death zone, nearly killing Fo Lu. This moment is critical as it's where Fo Lu completely loses faith in humanity and considers them irredeemable at this point. He already didn't have much hope, but even he's surprised by how truly wicked and evil some of humanity can be. To make matters worse, when he sees Mammy's bell fall from the sky, he puts two and two together, inciting an uncontrollable rage within him, prompting the last act of the game. And that last act? Man. The scene where you actually find out what happened to Nina's sister Elena is one scene I'll never forget. The Empire found out a way to create gods out of humans, effectively turning them into absolutely giant monstrosities where they can receive an endless amount of torture and never die. There is one weapon that can kill gods, however, and Alina asks Kray to end her suffering with it. It's a really sad scene. To twist that emotional, metaphorical knife even further, the guy behind all of this, Yuna, fucking gets away with everything. Fuck this guy. He even appears in the ending of the game when all the gods are disappearing and straight up says he has no intention of stopping all the sins he's been committing and will continue to create gods out of tortured humans. Like talk about a happy ending, right? It just felt really bittersweet and like the true evil wasn't even stopped. I did read that there originally was supposed to be a final act of the game where you kill Yuna, but they had to cut it out due to time I guess. If that is the case, I suppose that makes sense, but even still, why even throw that last bit of him in the ending then? It's just a depressing thing to see at the journey's end. On that note, whatever happened to Ilgore and all the Ludian Alliance by the way? They kinda just drop the ball on that whole thing after their arc is over and you never hear from them again. Ilgore seemed like he was involved in some occult-like stuff too. Oh well. At least we got to see a definitive end with General Yom, and it was a pretty damn cool one at that. Don't get me wrong, Yom was a terrible person, I just like the way he goes out. Once he realizes Fo Lu's full powers have returned, he knows their efforts are futile at that point and offers himself as a sacrifice. It's like he's like, Well, that's it, back it up boys, GG. We had him in the first half, but we don't stand a chance now. I just like how he owns up to his failures, takes responsibility for his actions, and his final words about how all of our time comes eventually, it's just up to you to decide how and when. Obviously this isn't exactly true as you can't account for accidents and stuff like that, but I just like the idea it represents. And really, that's a sentence I could apply to the whole game. I just love all the ideas that the themes in Breath of Fire 4 represent. I don't think the story always handles things the best, but it does have fantastic concepts and some of the hardest hitting scenes I've ever seen in an RPG. As an overall game, it's extremely polished with gorgeous visuals, a top notch soundtrack, and incredibly fun gameplay. It's nothing short of a damn shame that this is basically the last traditional Breath of Fire game we ever got. I know Dragon Quarter is a very polarizing game and some people do love it, but yeah, I think it's safe to say it was still a radical departure from the series. And Breath of Fire 6, the shitty mobile game, yeah, we, we don't talk about that one here. Look at what they did to my boy. Oh well, at least Breath of Fire 4 is an amazing game. With that said, it's not perfect though either. There are many things that Breath of Fire 4 absolutely does the best in the series. However, it definitely falls short in the world map and dragon transformation system. All they need to do is just combine all of these best components and they can easily create an absolute masterpiece Breath of Fire game. All the tools for greatness are right there. The fact that this potential has yet to be realized does sadden me, but it is what it is. I'm just grateful that we did get the games that we did, especially Breath of Fire 4, as it's the peak of the series in many ways, one of the best RPGs on the original PlayStation, and one of the most memorable RPGs I've ever played. Thank you for this special experience, Capcom.
Alright, that about wraps up this video. Thanks for watching everyone, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider hitting that like button, or even subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. I know this was a way longer retrospective than we usually do, but what can I say? The story just moved me a lot in this one, and I felt compelled to talk about it. Plus, I wanted to give the game full justice after our Breath of Fire 3 retrospective. It's not bad, it's just one of our earliest videos and the second retrospective we ever put out, and I hadn't really found my footing with my reviewing and narration skills yet. The editing is solid though, as Evans always killed it there. But yeah, how do you guys feel about Breath of Fire 4 though? As a standalone game, and in comparison to the series? Let us know in the comments below. For me personally, it's almost impossible to pick between 3 and 4, as they both do some things the best in the series, and other things, not so much. They're both amazing titles, and I'd say they tie as my favorite in the series. As always, just want to give a huge thanks to our Patreon supporters, and an extra special shout out to Jesse Spencer for joining our highest tier. Thank you all so much for the support, it truly means a lot. Other than that, thanks again for watching everyone, and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time.